It's the Jim Fan Show. Michael Johns is joining me next. Like it if you like it. Share it if you just fuck. Well, just like it. Share it. Who cares? Welcome Periscope, Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, D Live. It's the Jim Fernand Show. Welcome aboard, crew. That's my own music, made by local studs right here in Niagara. Welcome aboard, Michael Johns. Man, what an interesting character, and he's been making. Media appearances all over the place. Busy man. So I really appreciate the time. He will join me at the top of the hour, which is 1 p.m. EST. That's my time. The co-founder of the National Tea Party. And, uh, well, the movement, I guess. The Tea Party is actually a party. And a former speechwriter for George Bush Sr., and uh, he's a policy analyst at uh, Heritage, as you see on the screen right here. And a grad of the University of Miami. Here's fear. That's, we're not going there today, I don't think. And here's my guest. He also has a Facebook page. Oh, you don't want to see those notifications coming up there. You probably don't want to send me messages while I'm broadcasting live. I will be carrying the minister responsible for screwing over our native peoples for potable water. He said this was an election promise, right? Indigenous peoples, natives, we're supposed to have clean drinking water already, and they're not getting it. There's my doorbell. Excuse me while I let my guest in. How do you do this? Oh, I need a producer. <laughs> Here we go. We're going to admit Mr. Johns. And then we're going to go live to him. Mr. Johns, can you hear me okay? Jim, how you doing? I'm good, man. We're already live. Uh, our pictures aren't up yet, but I really appreciate your time. Man, you're a busy man these days. Thanks for the time. Yeah. Very frantic moment for our country. Yeah. And you're welcome. Good to be with you. Yeah, awesome. Maybe could you just spend a little bit of time briefly describing who you are, where you came from, and how you got to this point? Uh, that's a long story. I mean, so yeah, I... Uh, we, got, we got as long as you need, but you can be brief if you like. <laughs> I grew up in the Lehigh Valley area of Pennsylvania, very uh, blue-collar, uh, hard-working um, sort of purple political region of the, of the country, watching a lot of um, industry shut down in the 80s and uh, kind of came up, it kind of sparked a little bit of my political interest. I didn't really spark any ideology, but from there I went to the University of Miami and developed a lot of uh, close friends, Cuban American friends and told stories of um, they were played under communist Cuba. I kind of became involved in the Reagan era at that time and did some DC internships and was very involved as president of the college Republicans at the university. Um, went to Washington DC after graduating and worked with the heritage foundation, probably the world's leading conservative think tank for five years as a first an editor of their magazine. And then as a foreign policy analyst, Worked with the Republican governor of New Jersey, Tom Kane, who also chaired the 9-11 Commission. Um, went into the first Bush administration as a White House speechwriter to President Bush. Relevant to this moment, when that administration um, ended, I w became director of an um, organization called the International Republican Institute that was highly involved in um, providing guidance to developing democracies around the world about how to develop political parties and democratic infrastructure and civil society and uh, how to run free and fair elections because we're the global expert in that, you know? <laughs> I see your um, tongue in cheek. At the, time, at the time, I certainly felt that we were. Mm -hmm. um, I went in the healthcare industry, worked with a, a good number of um, three major Fortune 1000 
um, healthcare providers. And um, 2009, I was one of the co-founders of our uh, Tea Party movement and have been heavily engaged in that. I was a day one supporter of Donald Trump on uh, June 16th, 2015. Generally, I've been very supportive of his um, of the candidacy in 16 and then of his presidency for the last four years. Um, and, um, you know, I've done a lot of writing and then on public policy as well, Wall Street Journal, Christian Science Monitor, Ashford View, many, many book chapters and, and, um, articles and things of that nature. Well, you're deep into it. I, um, I'm a 10 time political candidate here in Canada, mostly for the Green Party on the left. And uh, it shocks me that even five years ago, almost to the day, I was in the middle of my last Green Party candidacy. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I never ran because I thought I was going to get elected. At the time, I think I felt like the left needed a voice. Um, it certainly doesn't now. And I've been painfully red pilled over the last five years to a moderate center position of conservative values of free speech of, you know, more gun laws aren't going to make safer communities, just uh, immigration, all of it. And uh, I was yeah. never a Trump fan. And I was, I actually gave Trudeau some room to impress me. I was so tired of the leadership under Stephen Harper, who was the last conservative uh, prime minister, that I was really hopeful for the liberals, but that was again as a lefty. Uh, when And I was kind of moving towards the center even when Trudeau came in, but I gave him room. I did the same with Trump. I gave him room to, I just made a deal with myself that I wasn't going to hate him. All right? I, was gonna, I wasn't going to generate any new hate for him. I wasn't going to, I like where my hate is placed right now. It's pretty strategically placed on things that he should hate, you know? Um, and I didn't watch him come down the escalator. And I just, I gave him room. And then, well, he won me over with his humor, his anti-establishment uh, presence, his accessibility during COVID, man, on immigration, on China, on uh, mail-in ballots, on all this. He just started, he just kept lining up with me. I, 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 you know, my Twitter bio says I'm a reluctant Trump fan because the left took him out of context so often I found myself defending him. He certainly doesn't need me to defend him. He can do that well himself. But I say all that to say I'm kind of new, but now I'm obsessed with American politics and Trump, uh, all of it, Congress, the Senate, the election. And I was on with uh, Eric Matheny and the boys the other day, and I, 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 yeah. I truly yeah. asked these guys because I want to know, and I, I get the answer that the sovereignty of the states is important. You know, when it came to the occupied area in Seattle, I said, roll the tanks. My conservative, my MAGA crew on Twitter was like, easy, bro, easy. No, we can't do that. Um, I don't understand the states changing the way you elect the most important office in the world right before the election and how mm -hmm. that goes. And man, if Bannon and Stone were here, I don't think we would have been tolerating that kind of stuff. But uh, right. so, and then I've heard you refer you refer to purple states. Is purple states the way I understand it? The ones that are up well, for grabs, they go back and forth. I guess swing state would be swing state. Yeah, right. Rates, okay. Meaning it's a roughly equal mm -hmm. um, distribution of Democrat and Republican registered voters and independents right. in that mix. Okay, so let's get into today. What are your frustrations? What do you find yourself on the media? I know you're doing lots of media work. Um, man, you've gotten quite the following on Twitter. I saw, geez, you retweeted me yesterday. Am I, am I, I can't believe the response, but that, you've got a huge account. So what do you find yourself uh, you know, speaking to today? What do people want to hear from you? I just can't think of any single or greater issue at this moment than the fact that we have demonstrable fraud in this uh, 2020 election, and we have institutions in our country and um, a major party that's been apparently a beneficiary of that fraud who seem th to be unwilling to want to just even confront the facts. And I can't speak to the magnet. Like, I'm not, I think you've got sort of various categories. There's people who have no idea what's going on. That's a very unfortunate reality. It's partly a product of media not covering these issues. We've got people who feel that it's Trump whining, which if it were that, and if I had looked at it, even as a Trump supporter, and I believe that to be, if this were an issue of, of him just finding, you know, some 
way to leave and, and blame the whole system and there was no substance to it. I'd be the first one on here saying that that was the case. Um, we have people like myself who believe, who've looked at it in great detail, who've been involved in looking at it in great detail, who feel that the fraud is, is indisputable and uh, needs to be litigated, investigated, uh, and that it's raising really hugely important even constitutional questions because we cannot inaugurate and swear in a uh, president who did not win 270 electoral votes fairly. And then there's probably another group over there of people who feel that in a country of 330 million that Trump won 700 million votes and um, that this is, um, you know, really, um, you know, that is, that is, it's just, you know, a personal thing. So, you know, in my view, it's, it, you, there's probably close to 10 different categories of fraud that have been employed here. Um, it certainly does appear coordinated. And I am just flabbergasted at how unseriously it's been taken, including by people who have spent their lifetime saying that they were running organizations, were committing themselves to our constitution when the centerpiece of that constitution, representative democracy, is under an unprecedented assault in this country. Great points. And, uh, you know, I think it's an uphill battle. I don't know that it is in court. I hope th- I hope that you get a fair hearing in court for this kind of stuff. But the media just doesn't want to talk to about it. Now, we, we're pretty aware that the, the media is pretty left-leaning, and uh, they do what they can to promote the issues that they feel uh, they agree with, for lack of a better term. And you just... Is that even ideological? You know, I'm sort of at the point where I'm starting to conclude that these things aren't even ideologically driven. It's... And these are institutions of power that have aligned themselves, you know, out of probably selfish or, you know, self-centered reasons. I I, I mean... um, if you ask me to sort of say what is it about Biden that's appealing to anyone in this country, or why would 80 million Americans go out and vote for him with a 47-year track record that really you couldn't even really identify any major accomplishment? And uh, I think you'd struggle. And I'm I'm starting to conclude that this is more in it. This is more a, a, an issue of global uh, forces at play that have a very concrete agenda about where they want to take things. Um, China very much a, a big part of that. And this issue of autonomy and um, individual rights that somehow is standing in the way of those designs, you know? Um, and, it, and in many ways has created differences and, and conflict even among voting constituencies that um, wouldn't otherwise exist. You know, um, it, it's a shame. I mean, and you probably have seen it even with the Green Party. I mean, there's no, there's, there's a lot of support for sensible environmental policies in this country among conservatives. I mean, this line that somehow it's a big joke or we don't take it seriously is not true. We just have concerns with, say, this Paris Agreement. It's just a wealth redistribution scheme. It doesn't hold the single greatest polluter in the country, in the world. China accountable for anything. It doesn't require any diminished CO2 emissions on their part. Um, I'm sure as a, as a, as an activist in the green party, you, you probably share the concerns uh, of that, but I've seen these organizations being influenced by, you know, vast sums of money. So if you've got China money involved in U S based environmental organizations, it sort of becomes convenient to, point the finger at the U.S. while while we've been, I think, pretty consciously involved in this, and they've done absolutely nothing. I mean, they're the most reckless uh, polluter in the history of the world, and not one environmental um, concern really seems to be focused on that reality. Like, if you were going to get involved in this and you weren't part of this broader dialogue, I think you would start by saying, well, where do we start? environmentally you start with the worst offender and what can we do there and they have been completely inoculated from any criticism um of their 
unbelievably irresponsible practices. Michael Johns is my guest. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. What do you say? I know this is probably like going back to kindergarten. You've been a conservative all your life. I've uh, I've come around. I don't see uh, many people that come around the opposite way. They start out conservative and then go left. I think it's mostly left to right. What do you say to red pill someone quickly like your elevator pitch as far as if they're ideologically flexible, which most people aren't. I, I don't consider myself to be now. I was when I was a lefty because, you know, I had some conflicts, you know, my religion, you know, my, my take on abortion, even capital punishment came into question because it really didn't line up with how, what I believe my whole life. So what do you say to people that might be ideologically or politically flexible as far as getting them to come over to your side? Well, we have to have reasonable expectations what we want from government. Government is a solution to a lot of things. It's not a solution to everything. So um, you need to be conscious of the fact that government can do great degree of harm. And then whenever government comes knocking, offering something, there's usually a lot of footnotes attached to it that nobody gets a chance to read. The war on poverty is a perfect example in this country. Um, who doesn't want to conquer poverty? Who doesn't want to launch a war on poverty? But, you know, like we're decades into this whole thing now. And by every metric, the people that were designed to be lifted out of poverty by this program have had just the opposite result. They've been captured into a system of communities filled with violence, welfare dependency, incarcerations of parents, um, bad schools, drugs on the street, gun violence. Um, I think you start with a recognition that our constitution is got to be adhered to and has to be the governing uh, focus um, through which everything runs or we're a lawless society that's going to be driven by, you know, special interests and big money. I think you start with the fact of asking yourself a question, is money better off in the hands of people who can spend it and invest in their well-being and their kids' well-being, or is it better off in the hands of the government? That hopefully is answered, uh, a question that answers itself. Start with the fact of saying that in a world where capital can go anywhere, where jobs can be created anywhere, where companies can locate anywhere, do we want to be overly burdening and regulating companies or do we want to be creating a hospitable environment for job creators? Um, you start with, um, you know, those questions and then the issues of autonomy. I mean, like I, um, you know, if you took the issue of, of just border security, it's such a sensible thing that we have a country for a reason. And, um, you know, it's, we need to protect the people that are here. And we can't just recklessly be allowing people to sort of come in here. Um, I love that about Trump that he put such a focus on that. And it's not even just the southern border, but our overstayed visas. We're one of the few countries in the world where you literally can get a guest visa, fly into the United States, and never leave. And there's plenty of people today who are either citizens, green card holders, or are still here as illegals who came in exactly that way. Um, it's not received you know, nearly enough attention. Trump's brought attention to it. It's now a centerpiece, I think, of our conservative agenda. And then you start with the fact, that, I guess the final fact that I'd point out, that there's really ominous, threatening um, forces in the world that you know, seek to do bad things. Um, and I'd put China in that category, Russia to a certain extent in that category. Um, terrorist movements have been diminished on the watch of Trump. ISIS eliminated, but we're not done with, with Islamic extremism. Uh, are we better off with a strong national global presence strategically and in a defense and national security posture, or are we better off in a weak position? Obviously, we're better off strong, and that's um, a core component. It is kind of amazing how all these issues sort of align, and then kind of everyone subscribes to all of them and you don't get a whole lot of deviation. I also think we, um, you know, that we got to unify in this country, in the United States. And I think it's true in Canada too. I mean, I talked to all these guys out in Alberta who want to, you know, <laughs> break off from Canada. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's a lot of disgust with, um, uh, what's going on in Ottawa and the fact that, 
I've seen a lot of similarities of people who don't, who either have completely bought into this Trudeau vision, which is largely a globalist one, or, and then those who feel, well, this is not the course we want to go down at all and feel completely unrepresented in that government. Uh, that's part of the reason these fights have gotten so contentious, including in the United States, is that you think about what, however this thing works out for President Trump, and you know I'm not up to be honest. I'm gonna I'm gonna fight this, but I'm not under any illusions that this is gonna be easy or even optimistic about the outcome. Yeah. But um, you're gonna have you know seventy some million Americans who voted for this president who are now going to see a, a president come in and take the country in the complete polar opposite direction of what they voted for because he secured a few million votes in a few states, maybe, and, and maybe legally, maybe not legally. But it, it's, I think that's what makes it so difficult. I think that's what made it difficult for the left in 2016. It's what made it difficult for conservatives back in 2008 is that you have, as these parties have become very agenda driven, these become, um, there's no consolation prize in these presidential races. We don't have, um, you know, a kind of system where individuals are afforded some sort of proportionate representation, mm. like some countries of the world. And so uh, for a lot, for, you know, literally half the voter base, however this goes, they feel alienated uh, by it. Uh, I do think Trumpism has def- redefined the Republican Party. I think it's. I think he's brought a lot of positive things to the way we approach things. And yet, clearly, for whatever reason, I mean, there's these sort of people who vote based on an instinctual feel about a person. You know, did he alienate some people? He probably did, but were those people really voting for him anyway? You know, like did those people vote for McCain and Romney, and then they said, oh no. Uh, I don't like this guy's tweets. I'm not going to vote for him. I'm sort of more inclined to think when I encounter those people that they use his queen's demeanor, um, which you haven't grown up in kind of not in, not in the five boroughs, but in that general area as common demeanor as an excuse not to have to dive into the more complicated policy objections they have about him. Um, that's the way I see it right now, at least. You were touching on some of your work installing democracies around the world. I agree that uh, you know a safer world is is a better place for all of us, America, Canada, North, all of us. And um, I wonder what your thoughts are. are you, have you shifted any? You know, Trump's started to bring troops home. I think he's one. Well, he's got to be yeah. the most peaceful president of all time. Are, are you suffering from the opinion that? You know, maybe it's just time to look inward, take care of our own people inside our borders. You know, there's a this yeah. huge discussion about foreign aid, especially in our country, going out to countries where we can't control where they spend it. You know, how much are we really doing outside of our own borders and how much resources, how many resources could we turn back inward without being seemed to be xenophobic? For lack of yeah, term. I think the uh, my view, my views absolutely have evolved. I mean, so I, you know, if you look at the beginning of, of my involvement, it was Cold War period, and you know, I think you necessarily had to be engaged globally, or you had to be seen as you know not taking the Cold War seriously. And then even in the years following the Cold War, it's less appreciated now. But those were some really definitional years where we either were going to solidify these um, emerging democratic political systems or we're going to neglect them and see them maybe go in a negative direction. And many of them did go in a negative direction. Um, But at this point, the priority of the government of the United States has to be take care of the people of this country. I mean, we have millions of Americans now not in work. Uh, We have a a pandemic that... um, I think it's fair to say, I don't, aside from China, I don't know anyone disputing this, that China unleashed on the world and that we have got to get through um, for the purposes of public health, for the purposes of our economy, for the purposes of our sanity and safety. Um, and we have so many unaddressed issues in this country, education, um, health care. You know, I mean, I think it's a deficiency on our side there too. I mean, we need to 
I think our objections to Obamacare are very logical and sensible. Uh, I mean, I could talk to you just, it's not even really a healthcare plan. It's like a catastrophic plan, but you know, it's ridiculous that 10 years into this and our Tea Party movement led the fight against Obamacare that it comes time to repeal and replace. And we don't have a replacement plan that's like readily available. Um, that to me is like, when we talk about swamp problems, that's a big problem. And, um, you know, we're going to ultimately look back on this Trump administration and say, here are the things that went well and here are the things that didn't go well. I mean, one of the things that didn't go well is, you, yeah, which is, you, I mean, my conclusion is you can't, you can't fight the whole world simultaneously, right? So he's, you know, standing up boldly and correctly in some places. But um, the, um, the, you know, one of the areas that I think is going to really emerge as the weak point was his own personnel decisions. I mean, he put people in place, many of whom left and criticized and even led opposition to him and wrote books disparaging him. You got to be honest and say, look, those were bad hires. So uh, he's delivered a lot of promises. He, and the ones he didn't deliver, he certainly attempted to deliver. Um, did he bring us the best people, uh, which was promised in 16? I don't think so. I think he, I think he was put into a position of, of having to uh, compromise his judgment on some of that to people who represented they knew more. They really didn't. And a lot of time and some policy progress was sacrificed in the in the process. What do you feel in his communication strategy? I don't necessarily obviously want you to speak for him, but what's your take on uh, how much of his communication is his own, and how, like, how coachable is he? Was he as a candidate, and how much is he? I mean, my frustration when I work with people that are seeking office is that they don't listen to the political operatives that have the knowledge and know how to get people elected, know what works, knows what doesn't work. And you really want your candidate to be coachable. How much do you think he's fallen in line and how much do you think he's said, Bap, forget it. I'm doing my own thing out here. I don't think there's been any administration in my lifetime where the communications offices, you know, speech writing, the, the, the um, press secretary's office, the communications function itself has probably had as little influence as it has on Trump because there were just a lot of examples where, you know, they would carve out certain strategies and approaches and messaging. And most of the messaging at some point in there, I guess, probably like when Sarah Sanders left, I would say it was probably the moment where he just said, look, I'm just going to do this all myself. And he went out and most of the communication that came out of the White House were his South Juan um, press, you know, briefings of answering half a dozen or ten questions, and they be, and they kind of would take over the news cycle. Um, and I can understand his desire to want to do that. And and the things he did and said on those were basically good. I mean, I, I don't think it was hurtful. But you know, when you bring these experts in, you get to realize there's so many components to public messaging for a president of the United States. And it's so, and it's so profoundly impactful. I mean, it's not even just the popularity of the president or his agenda. I mean, you know, we literally are in a position where rhetoric can inflame global tensions. It could start wars. It can move markets. It can um, have all kinds of effects. So it, it is a sensitive undertaking. And there's also one of message discipline uh, because the, the people of the country are bombarded, and this is just this is true in corporate communications where I work too. Is that they're getting like thousand messages a day that they're being asked to absorb. They they may not be consciously aware that they're receiving them, but the commercials, there's there's messaging, there's their own interaction to keep people focused on what really matters. There needs to be a lot of repetition, and there needs to be a lot of explanation. Um, there shouldn't be any. Americans who's unable to at least articulate why the president believes the way he does, even if they disagree on that position. So I think some of it, um, he's a guy who personally has properly, I think, to his properly a great degree of self-confidence in his ability to accomplish things. And he's one of the most accomplished Americans of our lifetime, beyond any doubt, whatever you think of him, he's done extraordinary things. But you know, I, I've always been in the, the opinion that politics is a communal undertaking and 
requires a lot of collaboration and cooperation. And um, I'm also of the opinion that you never run into someone who doesn't probably know a whole lot more about one subject than you, at least one subject, if not more than you do. So that's why the staffing becomes important. If you get people who agree with your general sense of direction, where you want to take things, and they can add in, they can fill in some of the, the content and, and even the methodologies on how to get it done, that becomes a really valuable um, add-on. But if you spend, let's say, two years arguing with Rex Tillerson about whether to get out of the Iran agreement, when that was like a core foreign policy premise, like a whole bunch of questions emerged to me. One, why does Rex Tillerson go in the Trump administration at all, you know, when you disagree on fundamental positions like that? Uh, and two, why would that be, a, you know, a selection when you've got people whose foreign policy positions are completely aligned with yours, and yet there's example after example of these, and, and even when he was, literally when he was hospitalized, this is when this became just so profoundly uh, important to me. And I'm reading these Maggie Haberman pieces in the New York Times, quoting anonymous sources in the White House, criticizing the President of the United States and talking about what a political disaster it was when this guy is literally in the hospital. You've got that level of disloyalty in your administration. You have a really serious problem. And that was the one thing he could control. I don't think he, I think he awakened the American people to the bias of the media, but he couldn't change the media. Uh, he couldn't really, he tried to work with Democrats in, in Congress. You know, ultimately when they say we're, we'll resist is our, our motto. We're not dealing with you. There's very, what else can you do? I mean, you can try to exert some pressure. I think he did. Um, you can't control that. At the deep state, I suppose he could have done a lot more there too. I mean, I find it incredible that you can have an, an attorney, attorneys representing your campaign who say, hey, look, these individuals in our intel services may have been, in, or were, were implicated in this process of electoral fraud. That's an astonishing statement to make. But, you know, at that point, the leadership requires one of two things. You either accept the view of your attorneys and you terminate the people running those agencies or you get new attorneys. But to allow these kind of like conflicting uh, forces to play is a little bit indecisive. And, um, and look, I mean, I, I, I don't think, sadly, that this drain the swamp was a great motto but um, he's not leaving. Well, he won't, if he does leave Washington January 20, um, the swamp is very much in control and it will be one of the failures. And when you, when you look at four years of inability to have made substantial revisions in organizational structures, in personnel, um, I feel frankly, it is a lost opportunity. And I, and, it, and this is this is one of the messages that becomes complicated for somebody like me, who's who's been out front as a leading spokesperson for the president, is that you know you you've got these people who just like everything Trump does is correct, everything Trump does is bad. This more nuanced position is that he was the man for this job, that he's been a great president for this country, that he's been unfairly treated by just about every institution, but that. There were some things that could have been done better. It seems to me to be a reasonable one. Um, I'm not sure how hospitable he is personally to that level of messaging, but I certainly would say, look, on drain the swamp issues on a number of these promises, um, sadly, he's going to leave with um, not a lot of institutional change. But neither, you know, Obama didn't, you know, we blocked Obama for six of his eight years, the Tea Party Amendment did. I mean, you cannot, it's underappreciated globally, I think, the fact that in Tea Party versus Obama, Tea Party won. We defeated, we won 1,000 race, political races against Democrats during the Tea Party reign under Obama. Um, they had almost no su success. We had a recipe, we had a message, we had grassroots activism and engagement organization, good candidates that we recruited. I just think we beat them every step of the way. Uh, and I can't, you know, if I look at the future, if you bring this guy in, Biden, I, mean, I just think, that the, I think this country is going to turn on him pretty rapidly. They're going to sense that he does not have leadership. He has no secret recipe for uh, the pandemic. 
uh, and that his his policies are you know ones that are ultimately going to be detrimental economically and to the growth of the country, to the stability of the country. I think he's going to struggle immensely. It's hard to imagine that uh, an election could have this many irregularities and still allow uh, and still go forward as legitimate. I get the whole argument, especially the messaging coming from the Trump campaign, that this isn't about me. This is about the United States of America's future elections. You know, and I, when I watched this go down, I, I was kind of hopelessly saying, you know what? Another Republican will never be elected ever again if they if this is allowed to stand. What do you see as, you know, the, I know you're not a lawyer, but maybe you could speak to, I don't know, can you give us any hope that this might be turned around? And I don't know that, man, if this turns around and the House elects Trump president, Antifa is going to go wild forever. Like, there's, I haven't heard anything about Antifa lately, but... Uh, I'm not sure. And this is why I'm ideologically moderate and center. I just can't look at the left anymore and go, well, you, you disavow science, biology, facts that you don't seem to care about. And then not only do you welcome the rioting and the burning and the murder, you cheer it on. You well, actually what, reward what do it. They, you know, I, I would love to have a... Um peaceful dialogue as I attempted to have with Occupy Wall Street, by the way, um, not appreciated, but you know, I, I, I was, I went up there and proactively sought out and, you know, and articulated the fact that if we can agree on 10% of things, even as it relates to, to our fiscal policy and in banking policy, um, how powerful would that be if we can work together? You're not like, you're not, no American is my enemy. Is, is my position. You're not my enemy. Um, you know, if you get caught up in globalist um, unethical practices, or if you're, you know, obstructing the civil right of the American people to select their leadership, then maybe you are. But uh, these divides are not as clear cut as they used to be. I think they have been artificially designed and we need, you know, we need to try to break them down, but it takes two sides to want to do that. I have some really, I have some very concrete ideas about things we need to do. And the question is, can we do them? But I feel there's way too much power in the leadership of Congress. So a lot of these Republicans who I worked with in the 2020 election are now going to go to Washington as members of Congress, and they're filled with boiling over with enthusiasm about what they think they can do, how they can make a difference. They promised in their campaigns they would make a difference. But everyone knows in both parties, the first conversations you have when you get there are with the leaders of these respective uh, parties who pretty much say this is the way it goes. And the way it goes is you listen to what they say. I mean, if you're going to go as a newly elected Democrat and fight Nancy Pelosi, you're going nowhere. Um, they're going to primary you. They're not going to put you in any committees. None of your legislation is going to get to the floor. It becomes a horrible place to work. It's true on our side too. I mean, to a large extent. And then you sort of say, well, why do these leaders develop such hardened positions? Why aren't they a little more flexible in the understanding these these people don't report to the House Speaker or to the Senate or the to the House. Um, a, min- a minority leader, they report to the people of their district. Well, that's where money comes into to play and the fact that these parties have become instruments of big money and um, and and the, the division itself is a product of big money at play because most members of Congress on an individual basis, um, particularly newer ones, are decent people. Um, that find themselves in the machine, basically, with very little options on what to do, very little support outside to change the system that we have fallen into. And, um, you know, so that's a huge issue. And then you get these situations of divided government with a party, whether it's us or them, who says those are not acceptable options for us and don't, and don't, come to, you know, um, 
compromise on them and you get government by executive order and you know we're we're really in a major situation right now that i don't you know it's something i've talked about rhetorically it's something to be feared that we needed to avoid that was always a possibility but the, the fact that it's now right there knocking on the door is a terrifying wake-up moment i think to me and equally shocking is that it's not more terrifying to a greater number of americans because this is how autocracy gains its roots in a society it is ultimately through ambivalence. You know, people sort of sit, come to this conclusion. It's one that's been held a long time, but now it's really solidified. My vote doesn't matter. There's nothing I can do. Um, I don't control the system. You know, they feel helpless, powerless. In some ways they are if you allow these things to happen which is why we need to fight so hard to make sure that these are not institutionalized. And Trump is right. He, you know, he, if his only lasting legacy is that he uprooted these corrupt practices and put them to an end, that would be an extraordinary contribution to our country. What do you see if you take the uh, 2020 election out? I know that you're really focused on that right now, but what are the most important conversations you think or maybe some of your top issues that you're – most passionate about before this election came up and the and the controversy that surrounded it. Well, I mean, from starters, I mean, um, Biden talks is talked about repealing the Trump tax cuts, but the Trump tax cuts, eighty two percent of the middle class of this country receive tax relief, and then he simultaneously, politi for political purposes, tried to say, "Oh no, I just mean people who make over four hundred grand a year." Um, it, you know, so his position you, th that was never really resolved or um, reconciled. He was never really questioned on that fact. Uh, these Trump tax cuts were, were a big part of the 7 million plus jobs and the wage increases that we were starting to experience in the, before the pandemic hit. That's a, that's a big issue. I find it really disbelieving that um, as he can't, at Biden campaign, that he had any magic solution to the pandemic. Uh, as I pointed out, he opposed the travel ban, the January 31 travel ban with China, which was like the most important singular decision you could make. I mean, when you, 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 we didn't have even, we didn't even have samples of this virus yet. And it's not one that had ever existed before. This idea that there's some, you know, textbook that you rip off the shelf on how to handle these situations is, is not realistic. But the one obvious thing you do is you stop the bleeding by preventing people from the host country from entering. Trump acted urgently, quickly, and bravely um, in doing that. And, and um, Biden criticized it, calling it xenophobic, which didn't even make any sense to me. He never was asked to clarify at what point did he ultimately decide that stopping individuals from coming from the country that where this was originating was a bad um it was a good idea, not a bad idea. Um, there was no accountability on that. Um, I, I, I think his physical and mental health also was unscrutinized. I don't know what's going on with this guy, but um, to be blunt, no one's looking at him going, hey, he's in good, he's in good shape and he's up to this job. And let me tell you, this job doesn't stop. It doesn't rest. I mean, I've been close enough to it to tell you it's the, the, the single greatest skill set you can have to be president of the United States aside from a general vision of where you want to take things is your ability to just take all kinds of incoming. It's just like, boom, 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 boom. So, you know, in a given month, a typical person might make maybe one or two major decisions. Now we may imagine making one or two major decisions every five minutes. It's like a very different style. And there's so many components to the leadership. You know, you've got your national security, your interaction with leaders of the world. You've got the domestic economy. You've got the political dimension of interacting with people and, and explaining what you're doing and keeping your support level. You've got interaction with Congress. You have all these constituencies that want to um, press their issues. It's you have the staffing issues and, and and who you're listening to and who you're not listening to. It's an immensely demanding, almost overwhelmingly demanding job, which is why I said earlier that the staffing becomes important. Because if you have good people around you who are competent and share your vision, which is the most important part of it, um, it becomes at least a little bit easier. What's your prediction on, and I, I feel like, 
I might have created this own narrative for myself and then gone looking to prove it incorrectly. It seems like we're more divided than we've ever been, that men and women on just a whole are further apart than we've ever been, that our ideological possession is deeper on both sides. Uh, the, 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 the canyon between us is further apart. I, it seems to me, man, there's a whole lot of, you know, I, I said just the other day in an offhand remark, well, I like Trump more every day. I think he's anti, and, he's a, and you know, someone really close to me said, I want to punch you in the face right now. It, mm -hmm. And this is their reaction. And I think I went looking to prove it. And there's definitely been times in history when we've been more divided. I mean, we've had many wars. I mean, that's pretty deep division. Um, yeah, but domestically, you know, even you know, even if you took the most con the one contentious war that we had in Vietnam, uh, I would say we were a much more united country. I would in agree. The middle of the Vietnam War debate than we are today. You're exactly right. These views are uh, there's no. Look, I, I was trying to, I was asking rhetorically during the campaign, is there even an undecided voter out there? I mean, is there somebody literally who's looked at the last five years and not already concluded Trump is what we need or Trump absolutely needs to go? Mm -hmm. I can't imagine there were, there were too many voters who were sitting around scratching their head on these two completely polar opposite options. And if you say, well, why? Why has it changed so dramatically? Because I think if you took the cent central positions that Trump represented and that are basically core to contemporary conservatism, they're not terribly different than they were 50 years ago. It's I mean, just the mouth that it came out. That some people just couldn't uh, couldn't agree with the man because of his pr his presentation. Well, that that's a good question. I mean, and that is like I wish I could say for sure like if 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 the same agenda was being pursued in a in a, in a way that was more acceptable to these people who want to punch you and people in the face and they're all over the place would they be more accepting of it so when you sort of drill down and you say what was your what really was it that led you to oppose this man um a part, big part of it is the fact that the democrat party and the, and the progressive uh, agenda has itself become so radicalized, transparently socialist for the most part. So if you've got a guy who's out there who's not, who's actually taking steps that are anti-socialist, uh, they're strengthening our free market economy. And if your position is we should have, which I assume is Biden's position, we should have no border security. I mean, that, that itself is unbelievable to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, no one again has asked him, what point does illegal immigration become a problem to you? If it's <laughs> 11 to 30 million now, is it 50 million, 100 million, 150? What if, what's 150 million illegal immigrants in this country? Who could imagine you, that just saying, I want to end illegal immigration could be a controversial statement? I just, what's, wow. And, and, and again, I come back to these other countries, you know, <laughs> is there anything more hypocritical and almost disgraceful than seeing like China criticizing our border security. Can you think of any country in the world that has more screen? You know what the penalty for, is for entering China illegally? I mean, it's you're going to face a closed door trial. You're not going to have legal defense. I think you should be afraid you're of getting shot if you're sneaking across a border. <laughs> and you know what? When you do it that way, apparently people think twice about coming oh, into the country. Yeah. When you release them into the country and give them some date to show up in court 18 months from now shockingly mm -hmm. it's not enough deterrence seems yeah, common sense to me we have a border crossing at roxham road in canada that is uh, well it's we share the border with you guys um now these refugees seeking asylum are they've been through five countries before they come to canada including yours yeah and they bring their gucci luggage to the border, they walk straight across, it's unguarded, but there's someone on the other side, an official that will take them in an ambulance to a hotel room where they will wait for their welfare payments. And guys that are on retirement getting can of pension here are like, these guys sneak into our country, immediately get benefits that even my old age pension doesn't equal. and. Somehow, 
you know, we've got a leader here in Canada, uh, Max Bernier. Maxime is a conservative. He left the conservative because he just couldn't get anything done. Now he's got his own party that he's really having a hard time getting off the ground or even getting himself elected. He wants to put a, a complete moratorium on immigration. Just until we settle down after COVID, with the economy's not great, unemployment's through the roof, and this is somehow controversial. <laughs> I, like, again, I, th- I think it's pretty, I don't think it's controversial to say I want to end illegal immigration. I think you should fear getting shot if you cross a border at, at, a, a, at a point that's not, you know, <laughs> that's how, if you take border security seriously, that's what it looks like to me. I know that's going over the top a little bit, but... I just don't understand the left is, well, Ruben put it best, I think. I didn't leave the left, the left left me. Well, the left got so radical, including the media, that a guy that's moderate, center, position, right-leaning like me is seen as a radical extremist for some reason. But the people that are telling, you know, our pre pubescent children that they they can come become the opposite sex, all they got to take is these puberty blockers and get an operation before... They reach their natural period. That's that's somehow okay. It just, man, it, it leaves me wondering. The, you know, the biggest accomplishment of the left is their ability to stigmatize these issues. So there's not really a debate going on over them. I mean, because w- this is the other really big divide between the left and the right. The left have, has these absolutely uncompromisable views that are just supposed to be stipulated as indisputable divine fact and you know we kind of explain things in an integral statistical based you know metric based reason way um when and their policies with you look at what where the designs are they're not things that are coming up from the people uh rising it's top down it's you know this global progressive uh, elite that has, you know, what, what's been called the global reset. I mean, global reset is a real thing. It's not imagined. Uh, there is a, in fact, a design, uh, that would shift a lot of autonomy out of this country, uh, into a globalist arena and would ultimately be very detrimental for it, for us. But those issues, like when they decide an issue, it can't be, even debated or discussed, um, it becomes off limits. And then there's no limit as to what can be done. So this, I'm starting to see some stigma attached, even question, questioning these election practices. I sit there in Arizona, Michigan, you know, state after state that's now held here. And if you just watch person after person after person come up and describe these outrageous and transparently illegal processes that were utilized, and we're to be led to believe that we're just supposed to discount all of that. Um, I'm seeing it a lot also in just um, these labels they put on things, but this decision that just came out with the NASDAQ that that you have to now have, um, you know, every ethnic, sexual, gender constituency like represented, and you have to report this to be a member on that. Um, it's extraordinary uh, leap, and 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 now gets us into a position where you have one of the largest um, stock exchanges in the world, home to some of the fastest growing and most dynamic country companies in the world, that apparently need to be be now directed by predominantly these um, identity politics considerations, not by just let's go get the best people we can get. Yeah. And if it's all women, that's great. If it's if it's 100% all um, gays, great. Um, but this idea that somehow in, from a top down, whether it's government or whether it's these institutions should do it. And, I, you know, as someone who reads a lot of business media, which most in our Politi- in the political world, don't this bias that we've described in in the way uh, issues are handled in mainstream media is equally applicable to business media. I mean, I'm just astonished when you open these publications, some of which are the most iconic business publications in the world, 
it's all this sort of social engineering and, and progressive um, agenda, which I, and I, you know, they're entitled to their agenda, they're entitled to put it forward, but these aren't even things that are being like legitimately debates because they've been so stigmatized. Mm. You know, I'll be, I'll be interested to see, like on this NASDAQ thing, <laughs> some of the biggest companies in the world are now gonna have to report and, and, and could potentially ultimately be de- literally delisted from a stock exchange because by the by the exchange for a company that, that has no stake in that company doesn't run that company doesn't hold even one share in that company that they don't like the composition of their board is an astonishing thing and as opposed to blaming like where did that idea come from did nasdaq sit around and come up with that idea no i think they, hollywood came up with it it came from the oscars the left went in there and said this is what we expect you to do and if mm. you're not going to do it it becomes like extortion, basically. You know, right. they're very, they can be very threatening. And our side is like missing in action on these debates. Maybe right. we're writing a white paper here and there about why it's a bad idea, but that's not the way these decisions are getting made any longer. Do you see the pendulum swinging back? I, I feel like we've we've lost a sense of personal responsibility. This whole, you know, we treat minorities and women as victims. They need a hand up. Without the government helping out or placing these people in important positions, they wouldn't be there. Forget the meritocracy argument. Does the pendulum swing back to a point where we go, okay, this is America. You're in charge. Anybody can make it here. Just get off your ass and work hard. You can't be anything you want by just wishing for it. It takes hard work. It takes a plan. It takes connections. Sometimes it takes, you know, um, good people around you. I mean, we look at Prime Minister Trudeau here in Canada. Uh, The man is not intelligent, but he was smart enough to ride his father's name and put really good people around him that knew how to get him elected and keep him elected and make deals with guys like Jugmeet Singh, who was... I'm playing a video game with AOC the other day. Just, I cannot understand how we got this far left and how it ever comes back. You see it in the media. You see it in, uh, you know, I was speaking to people that get, you know, they have TDS, that's Trump derangement syndrome. These are not politically astute people. The only thing they're telling me that they want to punch me in my face for is because grab them by the pussy or good people on both sides or some other quote that's been taking out of context. These are not into intellectually politically savvy people that are educated on the issues. I mean, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, yeah, but I ran 10 elections. About, how do they feel about the Biden uh, sexual assault allegation? Oh no, that's what? just. Did they yeah. watch the 60 minutes Australia interview uh, with her? Because uh, while I believe in um, you know rule of law and you know legal process and and innocent until proven guilty, I don't think I've seen too many women who came forward who looked more believable than she did. And uh, boy, did that just not receive any attention? Just like the Hunter Biden scandal. I mean, literally, we just elect ostensibly we haven't elected anybody yet, but heading toward electing a guy who has hundreds of millions of dollars that come in from China, Russia, Ukraine, has all the, has, has spent his entire career, like when we say, what's he been doing the last 47 years? Well, he's been putting his family on boards. You know, his brother now I just had seen was on a board of an Iraqi company um, that uh, after he went to Iraq, there's this whole series of developments through those eight years of Obama where he was given authority on a certain country specific mission, he would fail in that mission. Like, so in Iraq, he was gone in, he was, he was charged with getting American soldiers protected from being prosecuted uh, under Iraqi law. And of course he failed there, but his brother comes away, he's on the board of a $1.5 billion Iraqi housing project. Uh, he goes into Ukraine to talk about the the issue of the Russian threat and how to deal with Crimea and 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 how to deal with the the corrupt Ukrainian political system, uh, one, which was then one of the worst in the world, fails completely and all that. But um, you know, Hunter Biden ends up on the Burisma board at uh, 50k or more a month with no experience in energy, no experience in Ukraine, probably couldn't tell you the capital of Ukraine before he was put on the Burisma board. Uh, he starts being getting involved with Russia, $3.5 million mysteriously just sent 
to to we still don't even know what that was for. It came out in two Senate investigations, and then you go to um, China. He goes into China to talk about curtailing their illegal activities in the waters of the South China Sea, and to get them to cease manipulating their currency, stealing our intellectual property. All of these steps fails in every one of those initiatives, but tens upon tens of millions uh, arrive into a private equity fund that this guy has set up uh, with other uh, relatives of, of in, John Kerry, um, uh, other individuals that were, that were you know, in positions of authority uh, at that time, John Kerry's son uh, being one, son, son-in-law since it was his, not his own son. Or, um, so the, the whole thing is, is um, Stepson, I should say. It's it's immensely troubling, and we had no serious coverage of it. Twitter famously blocked the New York Post links to even just general reporting on it. And these weren't speculative reports; these were reports based on email communication, test you know testimony, investigative reporting. Um, the American people needed to see that, and we've had some studies that have come out. A lot of Americans who said, "Look, if I had known the magnitude." of these foreign entanglements and, and a lack of explanation for them and how suggested they are of, of some pay to play scheme, they would not have voted for them. Mm. It, it's, it's very difficult to look at this election and not feel we've been cheated in 5,000 different ways. I mean, we're already fighting media bias, social media bias, um, you know, it, it, a very difficult, challenging environment to get the message through to the people. And then on top of that, you think about what they had to do to defeat Trump. I mean, it's astonishing. I mean, basically, mm release a pandemic on the world, um, you know, then it, it conduct all this illogical street violence, make Trump the victim somehow, or the, or the, or the re, or, or somehow responsible for an incident in Minneapolis that was conducted by a law enforcement officer managed by a Democrat mayor and a Democrat uh, city council, somehow transfer that onto some being Trump's responsibility. And then even all of that wasn't enough. They had to essentially engage in all of these seemingly illegal um, processes. Um, and um, and I just say, where was our side? Like I'm on this Dominion systems. Mm. Um, so I don't know how anyone could look at that and have 2,000 jurisdictions in this country, 27 or 28 states, ultimately adopt it and save all the systems available. This is the one that we want. I mean, I wish those people would be questioned. I think they should be, there's no investigation on that either. How are these, how could you possibly, you know, in 20 minutes, I looked into Dominion right after the election and it was clear, they had three big reports out of the state of Texas, which this is like the most completely susceptible to, to hacking uh, system that you could possibly identify. I want to respect your time. We're coming up in an hour. Michael Johns is my guest. Thank you for your time. Uh, in a perfect world. Um, and, and this might sound silly. You're the writer, director. You can you can write your fairy tale right from this point out. What's it look like, and what gets done in the next quarter? Let's say, obviously, Trump is back in the White House. How does it go? How does it play out? If you were to, if you, if this was your novel, and you're going to write it just the way you wanted it, how does it how does it go? Well, politically, we unearth every one of these illegal activities hopefully that's enough to put trump over 270 as the legal team believes it is we prevail in the two crucially important senate runoff case, um, races january 5 in georgia and the president uh is um uh re-elected and and uh, sworn in on january 20 and and with, with with a, a absolute commitment to fulfill all of these very bold and serious and important steps and maybe has even learned some lessons from the first term about the importance of the staffing around him and you know really gets back into the rally mode of building the, the support from the american people that's where this has to come from you know which i realized that back in 09 when we started the tea party movement that we weren't gonna, there wasn't any institution or, indi or individual out there that was gonna throw us a lifeline here. We had to build it up from the bottom up. That's still the case. And Trump is to his credit uh, capitalized on that immensely. And then we get through this pandemic, get the economy back working um, and, and um, 
hopefully have an, you know, an amazing story to tell of, of, of a president who has just overcome <laughs> extraordinary opposition, just hospitalized on a business. You see this guy hospitalized, released two weeks later, he's doing five rallies a day in five states. You know, I mean, just an incredible, what an incredible leader, whatever you think of him. I mean, oh, yeah. what I energy mean, how, brings to it. How uh, can you I, miss I, this, especially contrast to Sleepy Joe? I hate to use that moniker, but this guy's got more energy and you know what I, you know who I want for my prime minister? Somebody that's not going to get pushed around. You don't look at Trump and go, oh my, he, he's going up against Korea. He walked across the DMZ for crying out loud. He's taking mm -hmm. on China. He's taking on the media. He's There's nobody going to push this man around. So regardless of your political affiliation, can't you look at the guy and go, well, at least I got a strong leader. Like, I mean, I can recognize leadership. And I'm a critic of leadership almost everywhere. And Trump, yes, he's had some failings. I think the first debate, he he missed an opportunity there as far as, you know, his style. Then he came around in the second debate. So he's, I, I don't know that he's taken his advice as of, of his advisors, but he gets it. You know, that, that was a missed opportunity. Here we go. But I don't know how anyone can look at Joe Biden or Kamala Harris and go, yeah, I want this. I want these guys representing me on the world stage. I'm like, you know, Mr. Johns, I don't. How do we go out of this interview on a hopeful note? On like, do you have a message to your supporters or, or, or your opposition out there? Like, I, I get this whole idea. We need to come together, but it's got to be more than platitudes. It's got to be more than, you know, like if this oh, man. I wouldn't say that if I didn't feel we had the people. Look, I, I said there's three. There's three factors. There's the, the to victory here. There's end of the defense of the country. And one is you get out the right ideas. Mm -hmm. Two, the people have to be with you, and I think we have those two things. Okay. But then the three is you have to have you have to be able to operationalize all that in a political and a policy sense. And this is where we fall over our feet all the time. Mm. And, and not only do we fall over our feet all the time on it, we don't even to this day seem to recognize the the obvious leadership crisis that exists organizationally and in uh, the way we're going about things. So the methodologies have to be completely re-examined because uh, this is a communal undertaking. And if we don't get that, then we got a major you know, problem. So that really is my, I mean, I haven't really thought through it. I think that really is the key. And I also am encouraged, like there's a lot of movements around the world. This is not even just national unity, but global unity. So, you know, I mean, I, I hear from Pete, you know, I think the Brexit movement was in a lot of ways inspired by the Tea Party movement. I know for a fact it was. Um, I see a lot of those, those sentiments that are being admired and adopted elsewhere in Europe and in other regions of the world. Um, and and in and in your country in Canada all the time I'm hearing from people that just feel not represented by that government and um, that's headed so you can't say it's headed nowhere it's headed somewhere you know um, the uh, there's going to be political consequence to it and, and hopefully we all like I said we all basically unify and work together toward those those commonalities educate the American people and we have to over communicate because. Our messaging is not um, is is being. It's not even not. It's not that it's not represented. It's misrepresented in the public domain. I mean, I mean, literally to this day, talking, reading any U.S. media outlet, mainstream media outlet, you're seeing Trump's baseless allegations, his yeah. un, unverified allegations, his conspiratorial allegations. Every one of these statements that's come out of these things, that are in affidavits, are legal evidence. Mm -hmm. These are not, you, you might, you might, they might be uncomfortable to people. Uh, maybe they're not enough to give create 270 electoral votes. I don't know, but they're indisputably accurate. There seems, uh, there, there is no amount of evidence that would convince the media or left leaning Paul, um, you know, people ideological, uh, that would change their mind on Trump. <laughs> I don't know. I talked hey, to this somebody said the other day, but that's what's more troubling. They seem to you know like, if you're covering, said the pen, I mean, do you believe? that every Trump, that there were no Trump uh, poll watchers excluded from these locations when we have video after video of them being like held at, at you know, 
hundreds of yards away. We're, we're being escorted out of these facilities by police. I mean, it's de it's demonstrably, like I haven't even heard Democrats say that that hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. Clearly it happened. Not and to it mention. happened for a reason because with all these at, with all these mail-in ballots, it created an opportunity for them to uh, manipulate those yeah. ballots. And the chain of command. I mean, we've seen trucks driving around with hundreds of thousands you know, in, of ballots in, in, in the back in, of it. In a typical pickup. criminal legal case, a, a lack of verifiable chain of command would be a basis for a total dismission of the entire case. You you would it would you would have a, com, a complete vindication. Um, we have to take all of that seriously, and this is ultimately going to come down to state some state legislatures. They're going to have many of which are Republican. You know, controlled. Like you look at Pennsylvania is a great example. I mean, um, there is a, le a legal mechanism in place for them to resolve this fraud, even if courts don't validate it. And our courts too have become usually politicized. I mean, that's one of the, when you ask if I, why am I not optimistic, terribly about it. I'm not optimistic because I think the evidence is going to be overwhelming and persuasive. And I don't think these judges are going to do much about it. And there's case after case where that's been the unfortunate reality of it. Just on the way out, sir, uh, give me your thoughts on, again, I'm, you know, I'm obsessed with American politics now and only because of Trump and it's his fault. But how is it that you can have a federal election that has left the states to printing the ballots, collecting the ballots, counting the ballots, securing the ballots, and adjusting the rules just before the election I don't see how any of this flies with the Constitution. Like, again, I'm a little bit of a neophyte. I don't have all the answers, but I'm just like, well, wait a second. We've got a federal election in the most powerful office in the planet that's not run by the people that are, it's electing. Like, you would think there would be enough federal infrastructure across the states that they'd say, they could say, okay, well, these guys, okay, you're in charge. Here's where the ballots go. Because we've... We have a Democrat party that, you know, it's not like we just woke up to this issue of fraud. Um, I, I've, been, I've been addressing it for decades. I mean, it's, some of the solutions are so obvious, like voter identification. It's, when you go to register for voting, you should be given an ID card, just like you're given. That's well, what we do in Canada, card. paper ballots, and you show ID when you show up. <laughs> so it's Hello? like, here's your ID. It probably costs the state about two or three bucks to make one of those things. You give a photo on there, you have their address, their name, any, and some something that demonstrates its authenticity with insignias or whatever, um, that fixes a lot of these issues. And then you got to clear up these um, re voting roles that we have. So we have literally, like take me, I mean, I'm not uncommon uh, in having lived in probably six different states or so in this country, uh, each one of in which I voted, each one of which I registered, each one of which I'm still probably listed. Like if I literally wanted to fly around the country on election day, I probably could have voted in six different states and no one would have questioned that. No one would have learned about it. Uh, and it would have been entirely illegal to have done, but it should have not have been easily, it's so easily fixed. And we just refuse to do it. So we have dead people on the rolls. In the case in Nevada, which was all mail-in election, thousands upon thousands of ballots that were cast by people who no longer live in the state. That's ridiculous. It's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And it's embarrassing, frankly, because like I said, I mean, we uh, have historically been viewed as, you know, a premier representative democracy as an example to the world. And have been out for decades now since at least the um, end of World War II, trying to help transform the rest of the world uh, in adopting our best practices. We don't have best practices anymore until we get them back. Um, we don't have a lot really to, unfortunately, to say to the rest of the world about how to go about these things. And um, I hope that's, you know, Trump's got to get to the bottom of this. And if, if the Justice Department is not taking it seriously, you know, then you got you to make personnel changes. A lot, a lot of people think that should have been done a long time ago. In my quest to end this interview on a hopeful note, I think I'm, I'm, I'm probably be ineffective there. So let me summarize what your take is. That the Supreme Court is politically ineffective enough that they will be given 
all the evidence they need to make the ruling that they should make, but doesn't have the political will or the stones to stand up and go, okay, this election was rigged in so many ways. We got to do it again. Or I don't know. I don't know what the remedy is there. Yeah. That's but, a big part of it. What is the, you know, cause you're dealing with retroactive remedy, you know, which makes it an unusual, that, that's what always makes justice difficult because usually the crime, the harm that's been incurred is already been done. You can't undo it. Mm. Um, you know, I looked, I started looking state by state and going, guys, this is like so, so overwhelming that um, it presses up against what is even constitutionally available to us. I mean, could you redo the whole thing? I mean, I don't know. I, 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 if you've got a third of the country's um, systems of, of ballot counts, counting that were manipulated, you know, how do you not do that? What do you, what do, you do in a case like uh, Michigan, for instance, where you had hundreds, several hundred thousand ballots that were counted in the absence of poll watchers when the statute requires the poll watchers be allowed to watch every one of those? You only have, you, you either count those or you throw all of them out. Mm -hmm. Like there's not any middle range remedy on how to do that. And I think you have to err in taking all of these violations seriously. And that means throwing out a lot of these these votes that were uh, tabulated in illegal, unethical uh, ways. You think that, you know, that there's a possibility that this could be sent to the House, one state, one vote, majority takes it type of thing? Yeah, I mean, we got a lot of strategies at work, and you know, I wouldn't approach. I would be not continuing to address this if I didn't think that victory was a possibility. I do feel the most important message is it's inexcusable that we're in this situation after having to address these unusual um, and atypical remedies. We should have had a free and fair election, and we also needed to stop blaming the other side for doing their worst when we didn't do our best. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot more we need to know about the individuals who should have been. I mean, we knew. I, I could have told you, and, and anyone. In fact, Trump did tell you. He says Philadelphia bad things happen. That every. I mean, they just shut down their entire. Um, traffic court, it was that corrupt. There's judges in jail. There's a congressman in jail, which was what was mysterious about it leading up to this whole thing that we had this history of, that we had the, proactively starting in August or September where it looked like there were going to be a heavy duty amount of mail-in ballots. We, we kept being told in the media, there's no real serious history of fraud, electoral fraud. This is a total lie the conservatives are making up. And worse yet, there won't be in this one, like proactively, like they had some foresight to be able to determine that fact, that is a fact. I found that to be very concerning right away and probably suggestive of broader messaging that was acutely aware that there, was, that there were immense vulnerabilities and immense opportunities for, um, for fraud. And it also, to your point of Biden spending you know, basically the entire campaign season in his Wilmington, Delaware basement, which made no sense to most of us at the time, now makes a little more sense. You know, if, if, if you're going to them and saying, look, you're going to probably win the election, but if you don't, we got all these sort of steps in place that we're going to be able to take. You're probably feeling a little more confident now all of a sudden, like, well, why am I going to make the effort to go out and campaign and just misstate things and get more opponents? So we didn't campaign. And the fact that 80 million Americans voted for him is very much in question, in my view. Mm. And your message to guys like me that are politically addicted and feeling I, at, you know, the next day after I woke up at the election, I said, okay, that's it. I'm out. I'm, you know, I'm detached from the result of this. I think I was more in denial than I was saying I've been freed from this because I've invested a whole lot of time, energy, uh, you know, my intellectual curious, curiosity into, well, what's this thing about the cages? What's this? Uh, dreamers and, you know, look, yeah. looking at the, the issues in depth and, you know, the left has turned me off so much that I just feel like if these guys actually take control, 
like I feel hopeless. What do you what do you say even to the casual observer that goes, man, we're screwed if if this is allowed to go on, you know, uh, you know, I, I think my mother, if she was here, would say, Jimmy, who? How does it affect your life? Who's president of the United States? Go sell houses. You're a realtor. Go to work. Go make money. Don't know, take I, care I, of I, yourself. I That's it. I wish. Sometimes I just wake up and I wish I didn't know <laughs> yeah. things I knew. You wish you could I go back to that I obliviousness. <laughs> And it's kind of the red pill, blue the pill thing, right? You decide which pill you're going to take, you know? And um, when you take that red pill, it tastes like shit. And you decide intellectually that you're committed to knowing and understanding the truth, maintaining critical thinking, uh, understanding that the way things are explained to you may or may not be the way they really are. You know, you, it goes pretty deep in a, in, in a recognition that, um, of why we need individual, you know, rights and individual empowerment is that, um, you know, these, we are misrepresenting these things. I think from your standpoint, uh, I don't know, I'm on Sirius XM in Canada every okay. once in a while. They're not yeah. too bad, but right. if you could see a network of conservative broadcasters in Canada. I think the Canada, like the United States is screaming out of, of people that want to hear the truth. And I'll bet you could find half a dozen good colleagues put together, you know, sort of the next Salem media that we have in the U S or other, you know, uh, things. And, and, and really you, you can't under like Rush Limbaugh, who is now in a bad state of health, but is, whose contributions to this country have been immense. Um, you can't underestimate the impact that he's had just to be able to talk to regular Americans on a day to day basis about the things that are going on. And so what should you do? That's my best advice. Talk to Canadians and talk on an understandable level about why the things that should be done are not being done and why the things that can be done, um, uh, the things that are being done are, bad, are not necessarily in the, in the interests of Canadians. And I think you're gonna get across that message and you're gonna see a lot of people looking to be a lot more engaged in changing the direction of, uh, of that country and uh, ensuring that it is indeed glorious and free. Amen to that. Thank you very much for your time today. I find myself uh, thanking guys like you. I said the same thing to Matheny the other day. Eric, I'm a huge fan of Eric. He's come on my show like this. And yeah, then, he's a good guy. Oh, he's, an he's, a, he's an attorney. He get yeah, his. just bright and really good. The communication is it's almost flawless. I, I'm a big fan. Anyways, he invited me on his show the other day for a you know a 20 minute segment at the end of the show, and I'm like, dude, thank you. I'm the little guy. He goes, ah, oh, no, Jimmy, you're not the little guy. I've been on your show twice. Blah blah blah. So I appreciate your time. You didn't have to do this. Uh, just yeah. on the way out, who are your who are your allies? in this business? Like, who are you chummy with? Who are, who's got your back? Who are you, who are you working with? Well, I try to work with anyone and any, any, really everyone and anyone. Uh, but obviously, you know, as, uh, as a day one Trump supporter, I went a lot, I gave a lot of conservative credibility to Trump when he needed it, because one of the talking lines on him was that he was going to betray all these promises. He was just saying it. He didn't mean any of it. He was really a pro choice, um, liberal it would just he would totally he would run as concert and i said look no i don't think that's going to happen and uh that and i took a lot of incoming heat from that but i'm a movement conservative identify with any and all conservatives i'm a, a founder of the tea party movement so the 40 or million or so americans that are engaged in that are my allies and those who i don't like i said i don't really feel like i have enemies um aside from those who are engaged in in harmful consciously harmful policies or tactics. And there's just, it's much lately, it's been about the tactics of individual uh, assaults on people and violence and things like that. Um, those are inexcusable. And now if there's individuals who've been involved in any criminal component of, of election rigging, that's also obviously an inexcusable thing. So, and I, I view myself, you know, we use this label conservative. I don't know why, though. It, it's like, to me, my views are pretty centrist. You know, I mm -hmm. like, for instance, I never, I, I drew the term Medicare, Social Security are bedrocks of retirement now. Uh, maybe they could have been structured better. Maybe they could have been done differently. But they need, we need to stand by those programs at this point. I mean, that, you know, so I'm not, 
um, out there seeking some radical dismantling of things and looking to preserve and protect a country of promise for all Americans and especially for those Americans who've been underserved um, with really detrimental political leadership, uh, particularly in our cities in this country. I appreciate your message. It sounds open, tolerant, and uh, what's that when you work with the other side? Um, I can't remember. <laughs> my friend goes, goes fine when you're, so when you're yeah but just when you're open to a collaboration you know this is what we yeah. need uh this whole idea of uh, we got to come together as a platitude is kind of weak but man we're not going anywhere unless we work together and you'd think we could find some common ground you know i joke if uh trump cured cancer they'd complain that you know he contributed to the unemployment of all the people in the cancer industry <laughs> like it's just yeah. it's gotten yeah. so polarized and so divided and uh spiteful and angry and i hey, i put myself in that oh, camp too I mean, and, when and there's complicated reasons why i mean he he has threatened the core of liberalism mm -hmm. he took more african-american and hispanic votes than any republican presidential candidate in history he was starting to eat into their base he was taking away their image of, of being the, the party of the of common working men and women, depicting them as the elitist, the disengaged, selfish political force that they really were. This is why he was a threat, mm. is that ultimately he was he was redefining our party in ways that made it really relatable and and really shining a light on the absurdity of some of the things that they were embraced in. And of course they were threatened by that. Um, and that's where we're at still. So Thank you, Jim. Yeah, Keep in welcome, touch. Man. Keep up the good work. Thank you. And keep I me posted it. on what you're doing. All okay. right. Yeah, I appreciate Bye it. Now. Thank you. We'll talk soon. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> like, wow. Wow. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm a political junkie. So uh, conversations like that are important to me. And... <sighs> I didn't know what I was going to get from Michael Johns, but that did not suck. So for all of you that stuck around for the whole conversation, thank you. And if you like it that much, share it around. Peace, love, hug your neighbor, and um, while you're at it, take that mask off. It's not working. <laughs>